Hi everybody, okay, welcome back. We are looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We are looking at section 6.8, and that means we are looking at the tenses in the eo verbs, the epsilon verbs. Just a quick reminder, you've learned the forms and simple versions of the meanings of four tenses now, present, future, imperfect, and aorist. And there is a special case for how you uh, form those different verbs in the case of eo verbs, that is, verbs like phileo, where there is a weak epsilon at the end of the stem. Now, in Jeremy Duff's explanation of this, it's actually a bit concise, and when I first read it, I thought this is a bit confusing. Uh, it's not wrong, but I think there's an easier way of remembering what uh, Duff is getting at here and remembering these patterns. And if I explain the pattern to you, I think you may find it easier just to get it in your head, because there's a kind of logic to it. Let's begin, and I'll just explain by way of recap the, the logic of the pattern in the present, which you know already from a couple of chapters before. Then you'll see how that pattern extends into the present imperfect and aorist. The logic in the present, remember, is this weak epsilon wants to be part of something big, right? Like weak people always want to be big. Uh, the weak epsilon wants to be part of a, a diphthong, or it wants to turn into a long vowel. And therefore you make changes in the endings in order to make the epsilon part of a long vowel or a diphthong, where that's necessary. So, luo, luois, luay, luomen, luete, luusin is what you'd normally have. Well, philo, no change needed, long vowel. Phileis, no change needed, long uh, diphthong. Phile, no change needed, diphthong. Philomen, what? No, philumen because omen, the omicron on its own, is a short vowel, but umen is the corresponding diphthong, so we make that long. Same thing here, uh, luete doesn't become philete, it becomes philete, because uh, just as the o omicron goes to the u, so also the epsilon goes to the corresponding diphthong, a, and then final, finally, in the third person plural, philusin, luusin, that no change needed there because it's already part of a diphthong. So you see the principle. The weak epsilon, like all weak things and weak people, wants to be part of something big because it's so insecure, it wants to be large. So we change the endings where necessary to make it part of something big, a long vowel or a diphthong. Right. So what happens then in the future? Well, in the future, you've got a problem because the end of the stem, the epsilon here, is separated from the ending by the sigma suffix that comes in the future tense. What that means is there's nothing you can do to the ending to give the epsilon a chance of being long. The endings, therefore, stay exactly the same, and you know already they're the same as in the present, which makes them nice and easy to remember, the sigma stays in place also. The only way to make the weak epsilon long in the future is to turn it into a long vowel. And so in every case, it just turns into the long e, eta. So filet goes to filet, so filet seis, filet se, filet sumen, filet se, filet sete, filet susin. You see, sorry, filet somen. Did I say filet susin? Filet somen, filet sete, filet susin. Just to recap, you can't change the ending to make this part of something big because there's a sigma in the way. The only thing you can do is to change the epsilon itself into a long vowel, the long eta. Now, just skipping along to the end, the fourth column, I put the columns in the same order as in Duff's table on page 76, exactly the same thing happens for exactly the same reason in the aorist. The sigma separates the ending from where the weak epsilon is at the end of the stem. So there's nothing you can do to the ending to make the weak epsilon part of something bigger. So the ending stays the same, nice and easy to remember. You stick the sigma in because you have to have the sigma along with the epsilon augment to identify the aorist. And just as in the future, the weak epsilon the short weak epsilon turns into its corresponding long vowel, the eta. Ephilesa, ephilesas, ephilesen, and so on and so forth down the conjugation. 
That means it generates this nice easy pattern where you just slap the air trim before the sigma suffix. But once you know the logic and the reason for it, it kind of makes a bit more sense. So what of the imperfect then? Well, in the imperfect, you don't have the sigma suffix getting between the end of the stem and the ending. There's nothing there in the way. You have the epsilon augment to identify the imperfect, but no sigma suffix. So in that case, you're back to the principle that we highlighted with the present tense, where the epsilon likes to be part of something big, and therefore it either turns into a long vowel or it turns into a diphthong, and it turns into the diphthong that corresponds to the vowel at the beginning of the ending. So what do we... So on becomes un, s becomes ace, e or n becomes a. You don't get the, the removable new like you do sometimes um, in the uh, imperfect third singular of a luo verb. Omen becomes umen, ete becomes ete, and u, uh, on sorry, becomes un. Let's <laughs> be getting tangled up. But uh, there you are. You see the same logic at work. Um, always, 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 the epsilon being weak wants to be long, either part of a diphthong or turning into a long vowel. You accomplish that in the present and the imperfect by combining it with something, with the beginning of the ending where necessary to make it long. You can't do that in the future in the aorist, so it just goes long anyway, becomes an eta, and uh, that uh, goes before the sigma in the usual way, and then the ending remains unchanged. There are one or two other uh, quirks and tweaks. Um, for example, uh, there's, a, there's a footnote, I believe. Um, oh no, there's not a footnote there. Um, I'm forgetting the, um, that's right, in um, uh, point one, right at the bottom of page 65, uh, Duff makes the point that kaleo, one of the verbs you've already learned, which is an eto verb, the e epsilon doesn't change into an eta, it just remains as it is. I wouldn't worry about that so much because uh, as uh, time goes on, you'll get used to seeing things like that. And there are other quirks which are a little bit similar, but the principle of what happens to this epsilon in the uh, with verbs like phila o with a weak epsilon at the end of the stem is the important thing. If you get to grips with that, you'll be fine. Okay, that'll do for now. Keep working at this 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, and we'll have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time at all. God bless. Bye for now.